So this is probably a good time to open up to questions. Think about television content and film content as two separate pieces of content. Can you think about where they are in their sort of monetization life cycle? Where do you think there's more upside over the next five years? If you had to pick one, would you rather be in the television business or the film business? <laughs> Andrea? I have no idea. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know enough about the television yeah, business. Yeah, I would say really the same thing about the film business. Um, I, I'll say about the television business that I think that the that the kind of the new thing with television series going on to DVD has been a remarkable change to the DVD business as a whole. Um, and to the extent that television product can continue to find different avenues, then that's going to that's gonna be significant upside. I happen to think that we have a lot of upside, but again, I can't compare it. I, and I happen to think the appetite for both will continue to be strong. I, I don't see that waning at all. In what ways and to what extent does um, online piracy affect the industry? I'll be delicate on this. The Because um, <laughs> there are certain things I can't speak about, but um, it definitely affects our business, much like it affected the music business five, ten years ago. Um, the challenge for the music business was to find a way to get its product to its consumers in a way that makes you want to buy it. Um, I think that we're working on that right now, but I think I, I have to go back to what I said before to a different question, which is we invest a lot of money in our product and we intend to sell it. So to the extent that piracy is, is going on, uh, we're going to try to do whatever we can to combat it. Um, I mean, I think it's the reason that the ABC player came about was to Jeff's point, we need to be ahead of, we can't allow what happened to the music business to happen to us. So... Um, we're still offering it for free, but you have to watch commercials and people, or you can buy it for a dollar ninety nine on, the, on uh, iTunes. But for the most part, people would rather do the right thing than steal. So, um, if you can offer them those options, they will take them rather than steal. translated to is actual change in programming because some of these uh, distribution channels, they reflect a need in the consumer population, like people want it on demand. Like today I watch more TV because I can watch it when it's convenient for me rather than when it airs and then it's gone. Right. I catch more shows today because I can watch it when I'm done with work and I have time for it. And uh, when I have time for it, I don't have that much time for it, so I skip all the commercial in between and watch the 20 minutes that the show is. So have, but there hasn't been too much programming that's taken this paradigm and tried to make it a better monetization model. I know there's some experimentation on in-program in product placements and things like that, but nothing really has taken off. What's your take? Well, no, I think, I think that advertisers more and more um, are more and more aggressive every day about trying to do product integration into shows and films, and uh, you try to do it in the most, the best way you can without hurting the creative of the show, because ultimately people watch the show to be told a story. Right. And so if you can do it without the product getting in the way, then it's a great thing for the advertiser and a great thing for us. And I said this earlier, the best example of that for us was Sears um, being integrated into Extreme Makeover Home Edition because it was a win for the advertiser because they got a halo effect related to the show. It was a win for us because we got money from them. And it was a win for the, uh, the show itself because Sears gave a lot of money to each of those homes. But it still had the same commercials. Well, you have to. I, mean, yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't think integration will ever replace commercials. If there's not, not enough money, I, I don't think there's a way for that to happen. Yeah, I mean, the other reason is, you know, irrespective of the money, it's 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 very difficult to integrate. Yeah. I mean, it, it requires people to think about the fact that you know a car is going to appear in a particular context. You just can't go and you know, spend a hundred million dollars on thirty second slots like you can, you know, for more, more standard media. So it, it has a fundamental ceiling. 
Um, right. And the other ceiling is you know, what, what, what people are prepared to see as favorable or even credible. Yeah. I mean, that was my point about the creative. You cannot let the... Uh, the advertiser has a message they're trying to get out. They want to tell you every feature of their Chevy. We're not going to do that inside of a show. So they have to buy advertising to get that. There are a couple of products, though, that you know, either exist or we'll see more of. One would be you know, for a DVR, for instance, just to put a message on top of a fast-forwarded commercial so that you can still get an exposure even though it's being fast-forwarded. Um, you know, potentially, you might see more um, uh, you know, sub-branding or you know, tickers along the bottom or something like that. There, there are things you can do with different levels of aggressiveness to put ads into shows. Yeah, I mean, there are, uh, there are a lot of programmers and advertisers who have tried to either engineer around TiVo or engineer with TiVo. I, our opinion is that when they engineer with TiVo, it usually winds up better because, you know, consumers are going to fast forward whatever they're going to fast forward. But, you know, when we offer, you know, uh, TV extras, that if you're already recording a show, we can download something extra for you. Or if you pause a show at a certain point to, you know, answer some code that you then SMS, you know, and then you get some text back from the advertiser. That's the sort of product integration that, that works for everybody. By the way, people always talk about how TiVo is changing advertising. You know, people aren't watching commercials. Well, the remote control was when people stopped watching commercials, mm -hmm. when they had the power to turn the minute that you went to a commercial break. Yeah, yeah there's, uh, there's a couple of media executives you yeah. find out there that say that actually it makes people much more... Um, engaged with the commercial because they have to figure out when to stop the fast forward. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's true. The last pod, the last pod is the yes. most valuable pod because you have to stop before the end of the commercial. Um, I had a question for, for Andrea, and I think it implicates Evan as well, which is we've talked about the ad-based models for TV, but I'm wondering what your take is on sort of DVD sales and syndication and international distribution as um, being benefited by DVRs and TiVos. And in fact, like the reason why you're not going across the table and strangling Evan is not because of the criminal you know, ramifications, but because the TiVo is actually, ironically, helping build an audience for shows like Lost and Desperate Housewives and Grey's Anatomy is translating in the DVD sales and increasing syndication possibilities. Well, I'm not sure that it's translating. It's translating into the strength of the program on ABC. I don't, it's probably hurting DVD sales because more people are watching it on TiVo. I don't really know. I can't really speak to that. Um, and I'm not sure how it relates to international. Tell, explain. Or, or syndication. international domestic syndication, saying that the fact that people are recording these shows and able to watch them when they want uh -huh. is helping build an audience for them, which is then translating the increased ability to syndicate or sell DVDs or keep the program in the, in the public consciousness longer. Yeah, you know, I actually don't know that since I don't deal with the distribution side of it. So, sorry, I can't answer that question. I mean, I guess the, the one thing that I would say is we know that, you know, TiVo subscribers watch more TV than everybody else. Um, whether that's within the same amount of time by fast-forwarding commercials, uh, you know, um, is due to some of that. Um, you know, we, we find that DVR households in general, not just TiVo, but if you have a cable DVR, you are a kind of quasi-super consumer of television. So if that helps drive the audience, then, you know, so much the better. You know, the advertisers have to, you know, work around that the way they do. Um, you know, I think it'll be interesting with you know, whether it is DVD package distribution or our experiment with offering, you know, TV shows through Amazon, whether, you know, people come back and they then, you know, purchase a show they've already watched because they really, really want it or, or something like that. We heard that, that earlier that, um, that the talent prices keep rising and I'd like to hear your perspective on, you know, the opportunity for, I guess, New faces to sort of enter this market as well. Um, not to forget myself, but yeah. <laughs> just, just um, wondering, general, you know, what could be a catalyst for, you know, perhaps expanding the pool of talent and that sort of supply there? I mean, I think the it, the area that I develop in, unscripted series, has changed the game a lot because all of a sudden it went to zero percentage of, people, of network schedules to a, up to a third of network schedules. Much cheaper to produce because there's no talent, there's no actors. And there are no writers in those shows, so the economics are much better. Uh, I would say that it's always changing. I would say that the pool is refreshing. I mean, it's you know, we just had Jennifer Hudson win, which is you know from a reality show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, she won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress, and she's you know she's as new as it gets. And we're all you know there are, there are always going to be the big big stars who can carry a movie, but. Um, you know, if you look at that pool of stars, big stars versus even five years ago, they're different. 
It's America different. loves creating new stars. Yeah, absolutely. The other, the other, the other impact I would say of um, talent prices rising and the, and the economics of the business shifting is that you know talent. We co we're coming out of an era where talent was extracting all of their value up front. I mean, basically, nobody trusted, whether they should have or shouldn't have, nobody trusted the sort of back end of any of the, pro the projects they did. So uh, that's why talent fees got as enormous as they did. And, and the reality is the people who were paying them, whether it's a television production company or a film studio, they were paying them because they were worth it, certainly in success. You know, some actors are worth $30 million or more. Um, but what's happening now, I think, and I'm, you know, I was hired specifically because the agency is interested in investing talent more deeply into their own projects, and they would rather gamble and have a greater share of the upside of films that are working, and have, you know, a, perhaps a smaller guaranteed uh, income on those films that aren't going to work. And uh, that's going to be, I think, a really positive thing for the industry, and it's also, frankly, going to lead to an environment where. You know, we think talent makes a lot of money now, probably in the not so distant future, some talent is going to make an incredible amount of money. I mean, Tom Cruise is an example probably of the most recent people, but you know, he, he stands to make an extraordinary amount of money on his movies. We don't think about it. We, we look at athletes, we look at people who in the sports world make crazy amounts of money for just doing what they do, just playing sports. And I think you know, the sports industry and sports agents have learned how to monetize really effectively those athletes' uh, true value to the entertainment that they provide. We're just starting to do that, really, in the movie business. So I think content may get cheaper at the front end, but it's going to be really lucrative uh, for talent what in the back end. What's the economic and condition ratios and what, how the fee sliding has changed? I mean, the fee sliding from certain talent making you know, as much as $30 million or more up front on certain movies down to taking nothing, $250,000. Uh, but then the back end, you know, there it is possible to make a hundred million dollars or more. Uh, a lot of people could do that if their deals were structured differently uh, on their movies. So you know, when you see a movie gross a billion dollars, there's a lot of money to go around, and most of it hasn't been flowing to the talent. So, so structure back end deal with us on a hypothetical movie. So we're hearing from Jeff a concern about exhibition and potential impact on a box office on someone's home theater setup. So are you structuring back-end percentages as a function of domestic box office or international box office? Or are you structuring as a percentage of DVD sales, international domestic, which, as we've already heard, is being impacted by uh, download to own, the internet, YouTube. So are you saying, okay, well, we're going to discount whatever you can make on DVD and then say, we'll assume we can extract some rent from a download to own or a or an advertising supported online model. So as you build this out, say I'm, I'm a client who would get $30 million, and you say, well, here, I think you can make $100 million. What do you discount? What do you say is the growth rate? And how does that calculation change in the last week? That's a complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. here's, here's what I can say. I mean, there are a million permutations to talent deals, and a million ways the back end can be structured. The ideal structure, usually when I'm negotiating something and I'm never, you know, I'm advocating usually for the film or for the financier, I'm usually not advocating on behalf of the talent. But what I'm arguing generally is that a transparent deal with low fees where the talent is cut in at gross profit, uh, that's the best deal for them. If the film makes money, we want the talent to make money. If the film loses money, if the person who financed the movie is not making a profit, it doesn't make sense for the talent to be getting back in. So. You know, I think the sort of the fairest deal, the deal that's likely to work and carry forward, is a deal where it doesn't. You know, downloads can do well; they can do poorly. What really matters is how much money is flowing back into the financier's pocket. When are they actually recouped? Not when are they recouped through some accounting fiction that's, you know, being created by MBAs, so that you know it looks. Like <laughs> but that's you know that's that's the way it has worked. You know, we. we live in a business right now where there's a bunch of different realities. There's sort of the, the actual reality, econo the actual economics of the movie, and then there's a sort of structure we've created so that, you know, under an individual participant's formula, there the film is, you know, in profit or not. I think the best deal for talent uh, and the one that makes the most sense for the industry is one where when a film is actually profitable to those who gambled in the investment, uh, the talent is getting an incrementally larger piece of, of, uh, the, of the profit. You do have a different perspective than a lot of your fellow agents. That's well, for sure. I'm, not, I mean, I'm not beloved within the town. No, I know, but I mean that—that that is absolutely from a a 
representing a movie and an investor in a movie perspective. I mean, if you're if if you're a if you're a talent agent, you're these days as it was five ten years ago, you're still looking for that piece of the gross. You yeah, know, that. and that's what you want. You want the piece of the gross, and that's kind of all you want. And and, and on some level, you are just going to be capped out at whatever the you know the gross is, as, a, as opposed to taking a larger piece of of uh, the ultimate profit of what it is. That's exactly right, but that's why I think the frontier of the industry is the quality film sector. You know, the w- the way you beat down the talent agents is by starting with a piece of content. You know, a script, a remake of a foreign film that's so good that the talent needs to do it, period. And the mandate to the agent is, you know, not tell me which of these few potential projects is going to give you the most money, but find a way to get me into this movie. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's so the, the, the greatest amount of leverage a financier or a producer can have is to have content that talent desperately wants to participate in. And for me, as somebody who's trying to shift the economics of the business in a way that ultimately will benefit even the talent agents, um, but it's easier to start with those projects. Mm-hmm. And I think as Jeff will uh, acknowledge, you know, a few, getting the, a few very successful projects structured this way is suddenly going to change the kind of deals that those same talent agents want. They want gross now because they know gross. Yeah. But when someone's making, you know, extraordinary amount of money, you know, someone who shouldn't be, you know, when a sort of A minus, a B level movie star makes a huge check on the back end of a film, suddenly everybody's going to want a deal like that. I think we have time for one last question. How do you see the battle uh, between new media <laughs> and uh, old media playing out? For example, Google video shows CSI, and you have uh, new emerging uh, content such as uh, Amanda Condon from Rocket Boom. Um, will regular television broadcast through cable and uh, television in the air disappear? I don't think so. Well, yeah. yeah, it's a difficult question, isn't it? There's so many pieces in there. I mean, the one thing you really can say is that old media takes a while to go away. Also, radio didn't go away. <clears throat> it's just a matter of um, uh, certainly the competition has gotten much, much harder. I mean, and more intense. And again, there's a fight for your a person's time. That's what it's about. But um, people still want to relax and watch TV when they come home from work. They still want a passive viewing experience. They still want to sit on their sofa and relax and be told a good story. Maybe we should end on that note. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you all for coming. Nice to meet you.